Right. So, good morning, everyone. Hello, welcome to the next lecture for OPC. So, now the first lesson on the DPI track would be by the Wi-Fi lesson, flying the nest at a DPI port of Beam. Let's take it away. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I hope you've been having a lovely conference so far, and welcome to the final day. Uh, as was said, I am Arpad, um, a graduate from the University of Warwick, pretend, uh, presenting my um, final year project, um, sort of as a change of pace, as a something a little bit more lighthearted, a bit less serious than hardcore kernel development, but hopefully uh, just as useful and enlightening. So, just as a as an introduction, this is a sort of a beginner's perspective. Um, I was new to DPF at the beginning of this. I sort of read up all about it, all of the all of the classic playing around with filtering. I have some experience with network filtering before, which is sort of how I got into sort of the Linux kernel BPF side of everything. And I was sort of excited about the technology and where it was going. And so I thought in my undergraduate dissertation project, my sort of final year project, I should try and push the boundaries of what it can accomplish, um, push the limits of what it currently can do. So the goal of my project was to sort of do strange and unusual things with BPF. Of course, by the title, you can see where this is going, but I will also take you through a series of smaller example projects uh, things that BPF wasn't really supposed to do, but um, I think are worthwhile sort of experiments for it to try. And so that's sort of what I wanted to see. And, and as, an, as, a, as a beginner, hopefully going through all of these trials and tribulations, making all this work, I can give you a, a perspective on, on what's amazing about the developer ecosystem, um, what's missing, um, et cetera. So the current big trend in BPF, what is it? Well, the use cases are exploding. That's uh, sort of what's all around us, uh, both inside the kernel and without. A lot more developers are finding that BPF is the right tool for their job. Uh, so whether that's adding uh, more components of the kernel to become BPF aware or using it for new applications within the kernel or also in the user space. And so with that comes more complicated programs, more expectations about the ecosystem, more people relying on everything to work perfectly um, I think that's sort of the overarching goal of this conference as well. And so if we have a look, why are people so excited about this? What are the sort of main reasons drawing people to BPF? And I think it's a sort of a combination of three things. So of course, it's a performance, uh, it's a performance system it's oriented around JIT compilation. Um, it's of course portable because it's a portable independent ISO that can be ran anywhere. We have JITs for most all CPU architectures. And of course we have formal verification. Um, and the combination of two things I, th I think is truly rare. Like if I wanted to write a C or C++ program today and I wanted a combination of high performance, portability everywhere, and some formal verification for parts of my code, I don't know where else I could turn other than to BPF. So there is this unique combination of, of things that, that coalesce in BPF that I think are quite lovely and it's drawing a lot of people to the ecosystem. And of course, in the kernel, we know how this works. You, you compile some code, you get BPF by code, you throw it over to the kernel and it, and it hooks into subsystems. That's generally how it's used. And so if you compare it to user programs, which normally communicate through system calls, as we know, BPF programs hook into subsystems directly through events, which is a sort of an interesting new paradigm. It's how it's currently used. And a lot of companies have picked this up. So Cloudflare, Meta, Google, Netflix, Amazon, everyone is doing this and hooray, there's a there's an IETF working group to, to standardize this and, and sort of garner to everyone's needs. So yes, a lot of people are adopting BPF and they're loving it for these three main advantages. Where is it going in the future? I assume we're all expecting more and more diverse use cases. And so what I wanted to explore is, is where can it go? Where's the limits currently? Where are the boundaries where something will break, right? Where are the boundaries where what BPF just cannot accomplish this today? And maybe explore why that is, what we can do to fix it. So yeah, there's like a small ball of limitations that are gonna come up in this talk. Um, of course, BPF has a lot of limitations and I'm not putting this out as a negative. I understand that these are judicious design decisions that are required for BPF. BPF is a product of the kernel and it has to do its job well there. These limitations are carefully chosen, appropriate for the requirements. Um, but for the things that we're going to do, you know, running Doom on BPF, these are unfortunately going to be limitations, even though they are very fair and required for the task it's trying to do. So what's our agenda today? Well, first we're going to build user space BPF VM for reasons that we'll discuss later. I'll take you through how that worked. Um, and then we're going to do a series of mischievous things with BPF that are really not what they're usually supposed to do. So we're going to make a console application that processes text streams. 
then we're going to make DPF do some image processing, making pretty pictures even prettier. And then we're finally going to port Doom to DPF. So I understand this is not what you're supposed to do with DPF. <laughs> I understand this wasn't the design goal, but I think it's it's just an interesting question whether you could do it, right? Is it possible to run Doom on DPF? I think that's an interesting question in itself. So maybe put the motivation to one side and just enjoy the journey. Um, so let's begin with the virtual machine. First of all, why build one? There's many out there already um, that are lovely and well-supported, but uh, I needed a couple of custom features and I wanted a couple of custom features. So Intrinsics and, and, and the debugger and Python interface we'll discuss later. Um, the available options, their job is to be like the kernel or interface with the kernel, which I don't really require or uh, sort of impedes the things that I want to do. Um, and yeah, some of them don't have what you really need to run a large program like Doom. So we will make a VM. And this is sort of the internal layout. So don't worry too much about this. On the right, you compile some code with LLVM. You get an object file. We load it in to an offloader. Um, as the program gets loaded in, you put it into a virtual machine and it executes it, the decode and execute phases. So we're going to sort of visit each of these and, and sort of pretend we're, we're the interpreter and, and, and try and see how this works. So, you know, here's some C code that you might want to compile to BPF, very simple arithmetic. And if you compile it, you get this blob of instructions on the right. Um, how would our virtual machine execute this? Uh, really, very simply, here is the instruction encoding for BPF uh, put together into a lovely, lovely table. It's really, truly a, a very uh, Lindy and, and simple instruction set. I really do appreciate that. And so you essentially make a programmatic version of this to, to split your instructions up and decode them. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's, let's build an instruction parser. So we're focusing on this component of the virtual machine. And I just picked out one of those instructions that you saw inside of that, um, that object file from before. And we're going to see how our, our interpreter will actually look at this. Of course, this just corresponds to a, just a, a, a hexadecimal 64-bit number. Um, and we split that up into the components just according to that table. And you can see I've sort of written out the immediate um, into the immediate field. We have zero, uh, the number three in the immediate, of course, which is multiplying by three. A zero offset, a zero in the source register, the number one in the destination register, because this is a multiply register one operation. And then we have to decode the opcode. So let's go ahead and zoom in on the opcode a little bit. Um, if we break the opcode apart, you can see the first three bits denote the instruction class, which shows that it's a 64-bit ALU instruction. And if you explode that even further, you can see that the ALU opcode we're doing is a multiply. The source is an immediate, and of course, the the opcode class is a 64-bit operation. So the meaning of this instruction is an ALU64 multiplied by immediate. And so if you put it all together, you sort of this is the process that you go through inside of the code to understand the meaning of an instruction. And so here's a test case that does just that. You can see I just pasted the, in the hexadecimal value, and you can see it parses out as expected using the lovely uh, Linux enum flags for uh, encoding the opcode. You can see it works just fine. Um, moving on, how do we actually execute something like this? So if we have a look at the code that we are working on, very simple arithmetic here, um, and the blob of instructions that it actually generates, um, we have this huge table that came out kind of pixelated. I hope that looks okay on the large screen. Um, we have this huge table for the meaning of each of the instructions, which correspond to fairly uh, simple C constructs. Um, so essentially, to, to program up an interpreter like this, you just branch uh, on each of these um, cases, as you gain more and more information, you say, oh, this is a 64-bit arithmetic operation. Okay, now I'm going to do a multiply. Okay, it's actually on an immediate. And then there you just put uh, what the table tells you to do. So in this case, you just multiply the destination with the source. And this totally works. So here's a test case that, that runs today. You can just open an ELF object file using our, our just fopen. And then using our VM API, you can just load the program, create a virtual machine, put some values into the registers to get it started, execute the program, and apparently it should return 15 when you pass in three. Is that reasonable? Let's have a look. Yeah, so this is three plus three times three plus one, four, 12. Yeah, it should be 15. So yeah, BPF can do basic mathematics, lovely. Um, but did you catch that? There's actually something slightly off about this, uh, this ELF object file. Um, the call instruction looks somewhat strange. We have a bunch of um, hexadecimal FFs here. Um, that totally wouldn't work. That's two's complement, as it says, for negative one, or recalling the previous instruction. Um, so at this point, I'd like to, to introduce you to something called relocations, which you might be aware of. I genuinely think they're one of the hardest things in computer science. Um, they seem to be endlessly complicated, but because we had to build an ELF loader, we have to deal with ELF relocations. And so I went through the whole process of, of, of building one of these. So what are relocations? Uh, in the easiest 
sort of sort of comparison is they're just to-do notes left by the compiler. Right? So the compiler wants you to put, hey, I, I don't really know what the runtime address of this value will be, what the, the runtime address of this variable will be, or the runtime address of this function will be. So it puts in this to-do note on the fridge, like, hey, once we know where this is going to end up at runtime, please fill this in, like patch up this instruction, say where it ended up. And that sounds kind of easy, but I promise it gets rather complicated. Um, so if we look inside of an L file, we find a bunch of these sections between which you can have relocations. So you see classic sections like text and data and blah, 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 and then relocation sections, which have these sticky notes on the fridge. And so we can have, you can see all these bunch of arrows for all the sort of directions you can have relocations. So for example, here's a text to data relocation at the top right. Um, that could be something like um, an instruction, you know, that wants to print something is going to refer to a string in the data section. And so the compiler will put a sticky note on the fridge to say, hey, I want the address of that string. Could you please patch up this instruction to, to load the address of that string? Um, that sort of thing. And so here's a table of all the sorts of relocations directions you could have. Um, like we said, there could be text to text relocations. So that's instruction to instruction, aka an instruction that wants to know where another instruction ends up. So an example with that, that would be just a function call. Um, a text to data relocation, as we described, could be just you know, you calling print and re referring to a const char star. Um, but you can also have relocations from the data uh, segment saying like, hey, I want to know where this function ends up at runtime. So maybe I want to store a function pointer into data structure that'll end up with a data to text relocation. And finally, data to data relocations, which are pointers in between. You have two data structures in the static data segment and you want to point between them. That's going to end up with a data to data relocation. And then for BPF specifically, there's the lovely six standard BPF relocation types. These are architecture specific, obviously. Um, and they describe how to actually perform these operations. So when the compiler puts a sticky note on the fridge, it says, hey, this one's actually a 6432 relocation. So please follow the, the rules for how to calculate and, and patch up the instruction um, described by this relocation type. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't really fit a, so a, a useful code snippet on the screen because there are code loaders like 1,000, 1,200 lines of code. Um, and it's somewhat arcane, but trust me, it was rather difficult. Um, and so one of the things that I would uh, like to discuss, and I think there has been discussion about this in the community, is to make clear documentation of what the BPFL format is other than just what LLVM outputs today. Um, I think there has been progress since I did this work, um, and I'm not saying it was impossible, uh, but it also wasn't immediately welcoming how to implement these relocations. A lot of it took trial and error comparing against what the kernel does, what the compiler does. Um, the documentation wasn't really freestanding enough on its own. Um, so yeah, how does this compare to other VMs? So most VMs don't really, small VMs, you know, that you find on GitHub that people have made don't really do uploading. Uh, UBPF is used by a lot of people and it's really amazing. Um, uh, it also does text relocations. Uh, they, do, they do not implement data relocations, uh, whereas our virtual machine does. Um, and the kernel, of course, does everything, including Kaori, which, which we don't do, unfortunately. I didn't particularly have time, and it wasn't really necessary for this project. And so, yeah, um, in UBPF's code loader, they say we actually can only handle relocations that, that are on uh, the text segment, on, on instructions. Um, so that means you can't really have things like function pointers. You can't really have data structures that point to each other, um, which is obviously needed for Doom, which does that all the time. So. Why do I harp on so much about relocations? They should be an implementation detail that I probably should have just skipped over, but we did something interesting in our virtual machine. So just like how we have kernel helper functions in the kernel, we need sort of an idea of, 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 of greater power calling out to the outside world from our virtual machine. And so the way that we do that is the classic approach of intrinsics. So we have functions, uh, you can just happily declare functions in your BPF source code. And if you don't define them, they normally result in an undefined relocation. The compiler just says, oh, I don't know where this is. And then if you don't define them, you get a linker error, right? But uh, our virtual machine, when it loads your code and it finds these undefined relocations, it says, okay, this I don't know where this points, but actually someone has defined an intrinsic with the same signature. So it says, oh, I, you're asking for a function called read. You don't have that in your code, but the virtual machine actually exposes an intrinsic called read. So I'll just patch up that address so that when the BPF code calls read, it'll jump out to the virtual machine do all the special sauce stuff that you want it to do, whatever your intrinsic behavior is, and then it passes control back to BPF. And this allows you to, to access things outside of the virtual machine itself. And with that, we have a complete virtual machine that can, that can do all these tasks. So let's sort of put it through its paces with a command line application. And so we're gonna have a really ambitious first project of just uppercasing an input stream. 
uh, just until we see the first uppercase character really uh, advanced stuff. And the point of this is to bridge the gap as we're doing with intrinsics, see what, that we can make this work because it will be necessary for image processing in Doom. And so, yeah, the way that we do this, we have a real sense of runtime memory organization and intrinsics, uh, which I know is sort of sacrilege for BPF, but it was required for Doom. So the virtual machine can optionally expose a, a, a runtime memory organization like a heap and access to the, to the data and text regions. Um, and so here's a real example of, of code that runs today. Here's how you would write an intrinsic. Um, so uh, let's say you wanted to put an intrinsic called read, which, which just reads in a character from standard in. Um, you would define a normal function in the virtual machine that you could call it read intrinsic. And when BPF calls the function read, it'll jump out to this function called read intrinsic here. And you just get a pointer to the virtual machine. You're free to do whatever you want with it, um, including call get C. And um, when you get that character back, you're just happily placing it back into the return value register in BPF so that from the BPF side, it looks like it just called a function and it itself has read from standard input. And similarly for write, when it calls write, it's going to pass in the character that it wants to write as the first argument. So you just simply pull that off the shelf. You ask for register one in the virtual machine. You say, oh, that's the character it wants to put, and I'll just put it on your behalf. Um, and on the right here, you can see the code that actually makes this work. You just call the API function called add intrinsic. You give it a name, you give it a function pointer, and magically that will execute in your elf code as if it was as if your BPF had these superpowers to begin with. So it's, it's essentially kernel Hubble functions, but in our virtual machine. Excellent. So here's the full source code for how you how you uppercase an, in, uh, an input stream in BPF. You just keep track of, of whether this one's an uppercase or a lowercase alphanumeric character. Um, if it's lowercase and you're not stopping yet, you can uppercase it and just keep processing the stream. Lovely. So that's our first ambitious project. Let's move on to making pretty pictures prettier. Um, we've had a look at some of these limitations, but we're going to try and attack the sort of number crunching numeric limitations that you might expect BPF has with this project. Um, so yeah, that's sort of why we picked this. And of course, I have a little bit of familiarity with image processing. And so I selected a set of, a set of filters that I wanted to implement uh, from incredibly simple to, to somewhat complicated with kernel convolutions. Um, and so to load images, uh, I highly recommend you check out this, uh, the, the Farbfeld specification, uh, image specification, which we used to, to do this. So I convert a PNG into a Farbfeld and I process Farbfeld directly in BPF. The reason I do that is because this is the entire specification of Farfeld. It's It fits in one slide in a lovely box. Um, it just has a set of magic eight bytes, which happen to be the ASCII for Farbfeld. I think it's quite lovely. And then width and a height and then a 2D array of pixels. So you can immediately just process them. And so to parse quote unquote Farbfeld, you just declare a C structure that matches that exact table. And that's the entire parsing code for Farbfeld. Um, and happily, now we can just do, in this case, contrast boosting. You get passed in sort of a buffer that is the image, the FF image star parameter here. You check the magic value, you iterate over all the picture, all the pixels, and then you apply the contrast boosting algorithm, which we do in fixed point here. Multiply by alpha and add beta. And similarly enough for grayscaling, you do the same exact thing. You iterate over all the pixels, you calculate the luma, you fill it in, and you output it back out the other side. And with that, we have successfully made BPF do image processing. And you can see the sort of classic input um, test image peppers in the top left, contrast boosted and grayscaled. Um, and then in the middle bottom on the top right, you can see the convolution kernels. So the bottom one is sharpen and the top right one is edge detection. And then the bottom right, we have um, just a general purpose color conversion all done in BPF. Very simple, beautiful, straight C code. Um, and so finally, we get to, uh, without further ado, making Doom work on BPF. Now, Doom really needs no introduction, um, but really the question is, why would you want to do this? Uh, I mean, of course, it's a long-standing idea in computer science and in, in, in nerdy circles to port Doom to strange and unusual platforms. I think there's merit in just the challenge itself. But also, I have an interesting perspective on this, which is that it's sort of a yardstick for a platform being uh capable of anything you wanted to do like if you're able to pour doom to something you're pretty much able to do whatever you want with it that's kind of the meaning of porting doom to a platform is that you sort of conquered it you can do whatever you wish to do with it and that's exactly what we want to show for bpf we want to show how far can it go and if you can pour doom to it you can kind of say hey you can do pretty much anything um and so that's that's the sort of idea of porting doom to bpf um and yeah of course there's some there's some other 
good points that it showcases, especially the fact that Doom, you know, I didn't write Doom, uh, surprisingly enough. Um, the, all the other projects I wrote myself, which means I could bake in assumptions about, you know, maybe limitations to VPF or how the virtual machine works. With Doom, I can't do that. It's a, it's an existing code base that has to work the way it works. Um, and so it'll be a real challenge both for the virtual machine and VPF itself for, to run this. And so to begin with, um, there's a lot of toolkits to help you port Doom. Um, I use this uh, project called Doom Generic, which I, I really appreciate. Thank you for the contributors to this. Um, they essentially just split out to Doom and they, they made a set of functions that if you implement them, Doom will quote unquote just work. Um, of course, that's the idea. In practice, Doom is rather hard to even compile to BPF. Even though we have an amazing LLVM backend, it's not quite ready for Doom without a little bit of um, a little bit of massaging, as we'll see. So here comes sort of a, a cavalcade of, of issues that I ran into with, with LLVM trying to compile Doom. So first of all, sign division isn't supported in the instruction set, which is fair enough. It's not really required. Um, but at the same time, uh, there's no reason that LLVM shouldn't support sign division. Uh, instead of being one instruction, it can be four instructions and not make much difference. And unfortunately, Doom uses sign division everywhere. The default numeric data type in the Doom source code, if you have a look, is integer, even if they just are doing unsigned whatever numbers they just put integer for fun. So everywhere in the Doom source code, if there is a division, there is an LLVM crash that sort of does this sort of bug report type of error. Um, so every single place we had to patch up um, the sign division to avoid it or circumvent it or essentially implement what um, other compilers do where they replace sign division with an unsigned division and then they put the sign back in afterwards. Excellent. But most of the time it's harder than this because the LLVM crash reporting breaks. So on the previous slide, you can see that it told you exactly what instruction and what line this came from. So you can see this came from ammap.c line 300. Most of the time that doesn't work. So you just get the first instruction in the program, first line, first instruction. It says it's at d main.c. And I promise there's not a sign division on line zero of that file. So it's just like, oh, somewhere in the code, there's a sign division. Go find it and fix it, please. Um, even where sign division doesn't just show up when you do sign division, it shows up when you do pointer differences, because of course the semantics of pointer differences. Uh, it jumps by the size of the pointed to data structure. And so there's a division there. Um, and so that could count as a signed division. So anytime there's a pointer difference, which also happens a lot in Doom, we have to sort of patch around the signed division once again. Okay. Um, there's also no linker. So let's say you get uh, Doom to compile. There's no linker that you can currently use. That's currently changing, I suppose. But there's no linker that you can use to compile your pile of object files into a single executable, which is what we need, right? So even if you do succeed, what are you going to do? You can't run an executable because they're just a pile of .o files. So instead, we have to create a Unity build for Doom. So, so combine all of our C source code into a single translation unit so that when you compile it, you just get a single object file out. So basically, do the linking in the source code itself. So I did that. I, I put together a CMake uh, build configuration for this so that um, that can put together a Unity build for you by sort of putting the files in, in a in a topological ordering of dependencies and then compile it all in one go. Um, so that's great. Um, memset doesn't work. LLVM, LLVM crashes when you call memset, which is also reasonable. Um, although architecturally, there's also no reason that memset shouldn't work. Um, LLVM currently just says, oh, we don't have memset, so please stop. So you have to replace every call to memset with a manual definition of memset. That was entertaining. Uh, even if you replace memset with a manual definition, LLVM is, of course, very clever. It says, oh, you're doing memset. So I'll just replace your definition of memset with memset and then complain, which I think is rather entertaining. Um, so you have to sort of trick the compiler into saying, oh, this is memset, but it's not memset. Please don't replace it with memset. So we did that. Um, unfortunately, also, memset is inferred random places throughout the code as well. So in for loops where they're filling in arrays, they're just going to, the compiler just replaces it with a memset. So you have to go do that manually as well or avoid it somehow. <sighs> Pass by value is also not supported. Um, as we know, um, BPF has a fixed stack size and only so many registers. And so you can't really pass massive arguments through function parameters. So you need a way to sneak them by um, in spite of this limitation. And so every single case of uh, large function parameters had to be replaced with some side channel of passing arguments um, using something like the data region or something like that. Um, similarly, we only have so many registers and so much stack size, so you can't uh, LLVM isn't confident in spilling to the stack, um, and so you can't have um, 
you can't have too many arguments passed in to uh, to a function. But uh, apologies. And yeah, so if there's uh, too many arguments and that's not supported, then variadic arguments are definitely not going to be supported. Um, so any function that has, as it says, var args or struct return are not supported, both of which are sort of pervasive throughout the source code. So we needed to implement a sort of, again, a side channel of variadic arguments. Um, and the way that was done is with our intrinsic mechanism. So instead of actually passing the arguments, you just sort of uh, each argument in the variadic argument list um, calls an intrinsic to say, hey, I want to pass this as the first variadic argument. This is the second variadic argument, blah, 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 blah. Excellent. There's really not enough time to discuss all the issues, especially at runtime, the, the rendering bugs that, that I ran into. They're not particularly interesting with regard to BPF anyhow. One significant challenge was that Doom is a C program. It, you know, it expects to run on DOS or something, and it needs a C standard library. Um, and so we can't just supply that. You can't just link against libc and provide it to BPF because they wouldn't share the same address space. You don't really want to inject that in there. So what I did was I determined, like I just listed out all the undefined um, relocations. And I said, hey, all of those I need to implement out of libc. So I implemented like 40% of a libc inside of this virtual machine um, as BPF intrinsics, as we saw before. Um, and so with that, BPF can do things like open files and, and, and set timers and things like that. So in short, Doom is very, very hard to get working on BPF. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of whacking on the hood to make it work. Um, but one of my favorite quotes from, from one of my favorite game designers is the best excuse is that you just did it. And we did just to do it. Um, so here's, here's Doom running on BPF. Uh, sorry, the window is a little exploded out. I just took the screenshot a little bit ago. Um, but you can see this is, this is the Doom sort of splash page. And if you sort of go further, you can just play the game. And you can see it's, it's, it's running perfectly fine in a little tiny little window, all rendered in BPF. So the window management, the drawing, the opening of the files, every, the entire Doom source code works. And that includes things like supplying your own mod files. So if you want to play mods of Doom, you can now do that on BPF, which I think is kind of lovely. So um, let's sort of bring this back down to earth. We also did a couple of um, accessibility and, and just sort of fun side things. And first was a user space debugger because that's one of the issues currently facing the, the BPF ecosystem. So I just put together a simple step debugger for our virtual machine has a lovely little, little UI and it sort of looks like this. It's a source level debugger, so you can see the source code that it, that it came from and it's matched up with the current line of assembly or, or the current instruction that you're executing. And you can see the register file and then and, and, you know, do run to line and, and step to next instruction and stuff like that, um, which I think is kind of nice. And it's lovely to have for BPF finally and very useful for when you're debugging Doom. So that was good. And then we also put together a Python interface and sort of why is that? Well, iAdvisor's BCC is just like amazing, as we all know. And the, the, the Python front end that they have really just opens up the gates to, to, to more people like accessing BPF. And I think for a user space virtual machine, something similar would be really useful. And so I thought, why not? So let's just use our virtual machine as if it was a shared library, which it can totally be, and then just expose it in Python. Um, and so here's on the left, we can see the ease of use of BCC, sort of hello world type BCC program that just traces something, some uh, in this case clone. Um, and then on the right is the equivalent of just running some code in our virtual machine in Python. You can see it looks exactly like the test cases that we saw before, but just the syntax is Python syntax instead of C syntax. So you say, oh, I want, you know, I want the BPF API. I'm going to open an object file. I'll start a VM and I'll execute a program and then look at the registers. Beautiful. And you can do real work with this. It's not just sort of, uh, it's not just sort of fake. So this is the image processing example that running now in Python. And you can see this is a PyPlot window displaying the results of what BPF has output. So it's, it totally does work. It's not just for show. Um, but of course, that's not really lovely. I wanted to make sort of a more Pythonic interface for Python developers. And so on the left, you can see some you know, C source code that you might want to run in BPF. And you can just compile it with the line over there. And the interesting thing is you can write intrinsics that jump back out to Python. So now you have two-way communication between BPF and Python. So these intrinsics are now going to, when BPF calls add, that will take control back over to the Python interpreter, do it there, and then jump back into BPF. And the source code for this in Python is absolutely lovely. You just create a virtual machine. You can define a plain Python function that just gets some interesting arguments, um, and then just put it right onto the virtual machine. And then when you execute the program, those will be patched up. Those relocations will point to the Python source code. It'll jump back out, do whatever your Python wants to do, and then return control back to BPF, which I think is really rather lovely. So, what did we sort of learn? We've sort of attacked a bunch of limitations. We've, we've, we've tried a bunch of 
of things that you're really not supposed to do to BPF. And if you sort of bring this back down to earth, you're really not supposed to do this with BPF. And I understand that the, lyrics, the, the kernel documentation is very obviously clear on this. And, and I understand this isn't the point, but I think it, it is an enjoyable thing to do. And it is something that sheds a light on holes, gaps and opportunities in the ecosystem. And so if we have a look, um, we can see all of these, um, all of these steps we've sort of challenged a little bit now because, well, let's have a look. All of these issues that are listed in this documentation are now supported in this virtual machine, indirect calls, loops, global variables, jump tables, read-only sections. We have compiled a genuine C source code code base. So yeah, is BPF ready for prime time? Not yet, but it's almost there. So thank you very much. Oh, I still have some future work. Yes. Um, um, essentially, future work is to release this. Um, I can't do that immediately right now, but if you're interested in having a look, please ping me. Um, it'll take a little bit more to release the source code, but I'm on the case. And it would be nice to contribute to the LLVM backend because all of the issues that we uh, faced weren't actually architectural issues. We could get around them. LLVM could do that on your behalf. And so, yeah, thank you very much. Questions, comments? Hi, great work. Um... Do you like to look at the BPF time based upon all the features you've mentioned, like the Telco BPF SQL TM, based upon all the instruction relocation, like everything in EOS, like and QRE, or Have you looked at this? You can even run BPC oh, and BPF trace oh. with it. Oh, well, that's excellent. Um, I did pay attention to the development of BPF time. Um, um, sorry, is there a need to repeat the questions or does that, um, is that in the room? Is that, did everyone hear what the question was? Um, uh, just so to clarify. Maybe you, I think maybe you need okay, to okay. clear, clever way to do a relocation. Is that the key problem is every, every relocation is happening even even BPF. So the problem is that the, yeah, LVM and Libre BPF, they are separate, but they are tightly coupled. They have a bunch of functionality. <laughs> they, they, so they need to work together to support any real world programs. So maybe, maybe another way is that you can have like, some API to uh, get the physical output of Libre BPF to BPF to uh, use space eBPF runtime so you can support all the features and you can run our tools like BCC Python, <laughs> maybe? Yeah, that's totally feasible today. Um, of course, it would take a little bit of grunt work to implement everything that um, that you do need, but there's no technical limitation in the way of that. So, you don't need to implement everything. You just need to get a physical output of Libre GPF. Oh, and, and you're saying for it. Oh, that's kind of clever. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, that's what we do in BPF time to support all the real world programs and BCC like that. But I thought that when I read about BPF time, oops, sorry, go ahead. Um, so when I read up about BPF time, as I understood it, 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 it was based originally off of, it, wasn't it based originally off of UBPF as well as its execution engine? Support two execution engines. One is based on UBPF, another is based on another uh, user-based eBPF VM called LVM BPF implemented with LVM backend. I see, and that one supports all of the relocations. Okay, that's that's what's surprising to me. Excellent, that's great news. I'll have a look at that later. All that one support all the relocation. Every relocation is happening in Libre BPF. So you need to have Libre BPF to yes. use the eBPF runtime. VM and your space eBPF runtime may be two things, two different things. So maybe we can also try to use your VM in BPF time. That sounds like fun. That sounds like a fun project. Um, sure. Hey, um, I'm, I'm hoping you can answer the question that's probably burning on everyone's mind right now. How many frames per second did you think, or as a gentleman, just the seconds per frame? So 
you have a, a very sharp eye in the screenshot uh, before I might be able to go back. Um, my excuse will be that this was in a debug, what I call a debug debug build. Um, oh wow, this was a while ago. Um, you can see here we have um, half a frame per second, which I think is, is really quite lovely. So that's yeah, 0 0.49 frames per second. <laughs> Now it does run faster than that. Um, this was a little a little while ago, um, and the reason it's really that slow is because both the Doom source code and the uh, the virtual machine were built with uh, in debug configuration um, for this. And so with zero optimizations, you would you would expect that all those branching interpreter statements aren't going to look lovely. Um, I can put together a video of it running um, and sort of uh, post what what it runs at at full speed today, but I don't know what that is. Thanks for the presentation. Um, the most common way that you might be surprised to uh, learn is that client division is actually supported in the latest version of the instruction set. Yeah. What? That's amazing. Oh, okay. Congr first of all, congratulations. That's great news. Latest kernel, I believe it's Clang from Clang 18 onwards. It's supported, so already, already in. I will hop right on that and uh, put that into my virtual machine and have a huge smile on my face while doing it. <laughs> Did you encounter any other um, instructions that you can use to pass that are currently existing while in the process of porting? Well, it's not so much really about instructions. Um, Doom is a oh, to be honest, a fairly simple program. Um, it doesn't use floating point instructions. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't do anything crazy. It relates really, all integer maths and then a pile of control flow logic that BPF is already completely capable of. Um, I think really the the main learning of all of these projects is that the core BPF technology and 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 really the core components of the ecosystem as well are fully prepared to handle complicated programs like Doom large programs like Doom. Um, really what's what's missing is is the tooling and the support around it. So let's say you were developing something like Doom, something of the of the size and complexity of Doom for BPF. It would be horrible because you have no idea how to debug it or understand it, especially if it's running in the kernel. There's no real there's not is there's not enough tooling to understand a sophisticated program like this. Um, and so no I didn't run in, into anything in BPF itself. But yes, there is work to do in the tooling around it and the sort of developer support. That's my main takeaway. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're looking forward. Like once you publish all the um, everything, um, it should be awesome. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.